Hello, everyone. <clears throat> Thank you for joining us today. Um, Guidehouse in Pillsbury will be presenting on safeguarding your organization um, against cyber threats. Audience is uh, focused on healthcare, um, and we and we appreciate you all joining us uh, today. Uh, it's a particularly important topic in light of um, you know some re recent things that have been happening in the industry, and um, we're just uh, glad that. Uh, all have uh, joined us. So um, what we'll do is we'll start off today with some introductions. My name, um, as I said, is Matt Schwartz. I am a director at Guidehouse in our financial crime, fraud, and investigative services group. Uh, my focus is exclusively on healthcare. Uh, and for the past uh, 19 years or so, um, I have been working in healthcare regulatory compliance and fraud, waste, and abuse. Um, and I'll turn it over to Eric to introduce himself as well. Thanks, Matt. Uh, Eric Pupo, I am the Director for Commercial Health IT Advisory at Guidehouse. Work closely with our customers uh, in commercial health on many of their cybersecurity issues. Previously served as the Director for Healthcare Cybersecurity at Amazon, uh, and prior to that, the CIO at Columbia University Medical Center. And then Phil. Yep. Thanks, Matt. Phil Boone, uh, Associate Director with Guidehouse in our Digital Health Cybersecurity Group. Uh, my background is in security assessments, technical assurance, and cybersecurity risk management. Uh, for the past 13 years, I've worked with health systems, public health agencies, and state and local governments to help build and mature comprehensive cybersecurity programs. Great. Thanks, Phil. Uh, Brian? Great. Hi, everyone. I'm Brian Finch. I'm a partner at uh, Pillsbury Winthrop Shaw Pittman. I'm based in the D.C. office where I co-chair the firm's cybersecurity data protection privacy practice and represent a number of cybersecurity vendors as well as critical infrastructure owners and operators, folks in the commercial entertainment sector, and a wide variety of physical and cybersecurity issues. I'm glad to be here, and thanks to Guidehouse for, uh, for partnering with us today. Great. And then Mark? Thanks, Matt. Uh, my name is Mark Gertoski. I'm a partner at Pillsbury, uh, primarily in Silicon Valley. I um, am a leader on cyber disputes. Previously, I served as a cybercrime prosecutor and as national coordinator of the Computer Hacking and Intellectual Property Program, working on cybercrime for the uh, Department of Justice. And we look forward to uh, presenting uh, today on these uh, topics. Um, just just to get started here, we did want to give a, a preliminary disclaimer. Um, you know, the, the the presentation today it's it's uh, you know it's not going to be based on any particular case um, or any particular fact facts, but um, you know we're we're going to be referencing hypothetical scenarios, um, and it's and we're going to be drawing upon uh, the experience of our presenters, our collective experience. So that's important to note. Um, before we get going here, so thank you. So today's agenda, we'll, you know, we'll be uh, covering a wide variety of topics. We're anticipating that this is going to be the first in a series. Uh, we'll go into an introduction. We will uh, present to you on understanding ransomware. Uh, we will talk about, in the context of healthcare cybersecurity attacks, what the likely outcomes are going to be, what you can expect. So, for example, um, the, the expected government response, um, investigations and, and class action litigation that may stem uh, from, from cyber attacks, fraud implications coming on the heels of cyber attacks, prevention and recovery strategies, and then uh, we'll open it up for some closing remarks and, and questions. So, so let's begin. Um, Healthcare, the the healthcare industry right now is under attack. Um, the, you know, the, there's no better way to to put it. Um, cyber attacks are increasingly prevalent. Um, they are significant and disruptive events. In particular, in healthcare, they can impact the entire ecosystem: hospitals, insurers, pharmacies, medical groups, even patients. Um, and particularly in light of the fact that the healthcare industry has become increasingly interconnected and interoperable um, and digitized and uh, technology forward, uh, you know, the, the entire healthcare ecosystem is at risk and vulnerable to, uh, to increasingly uh, more frequent and larger 
cyber attacks, the impacts on the healthcare industry can be wide ranging um, from financial instability uh, for hospitals and providers to effects on operations and patient care, impacts related to delayed payments, uh, you know, the issues are myriad. There are also a variety of regulatory and legal responses that happen uh, on the back of uh, cyber incidents and, and data breaches, which are common. HIPAA compliance investigations by uh, groups like the OCR, congressional inquiries, lawsuits, um, and uh, disputes and the like are, are uh, you know, they, they are commonplace and, uh, you know, come part and parcel to these kinds of events. And fraud impacts, uh, you know, as I mentioned, on the back of cyber attacks, the industry and patients see upticks in fraud schemes from bad actors, not necessarily directly related to the to the cyber attack itself, just things that um, flow naturally from from those from those incidents as data gets out into the public. Um, and so we're going to talk about all these concepts. The other thing that we're going to uh, cover are some strategies for strengthening cybersecurity resilience for healthcare organizations. Uh, we'll talk about best practices in cybersecurity uh, and, and uh, touch on audits, training, threat detection, and, 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 and other items. So thank you all so much. At this point, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Phil Boone, who's going to uh, give an overview of, of understanding ransomware. Phil? Thank you, Matt. Uh, next slide, please. So as Matt just described, the healthcare industry is under attack. We are seeing devastating ransomware attacks and news headlines almost every day. But what, what exactly is ransomware? Ransomware is a form of malware that encrypts a victim's devices and files, making them unusable until a ransom demand is paid, um, usually through a cryptocurrency that's hard to trace, such as Bitcoin. Uh, we are seeing ransomware as industry agnostic all industries are being attacked. We are seeing cyber criminals target healthcare specifically due to the high likelihood of being paid since ransomware impacts critical medical processes and it threatens patient care. Uh, it forces hospitals to go back to pen and paper. EHR is becoming inaccessible. Monitoring systems can't be trusted. Ambulances have to be di diverted to other ERs. Prescriptions can't be filled. And, and lastly, funds that were allocated to modernization they are instead used to pay ransoms and restore systems. So uh, to provide some context on the impact to the health industry, we include a few key statistics here from the FBI, Compare Attack, and IBM Security. So the FBI found that last year, the healthcare and public health sector was the critical infrastructure sector that was most targeted by ransomware operators. And we're going to talk through a few of the reasons why. Uh, research firm Compare Attack found that ransomware attacks cost the U.S. health, se health sector $77.5 billion in downtime between 2016 and October of last year. It's important to note that this cost is just downtime. It does not include associated costs around rebuilding networks, around restoring systems, uh, engaging specialized incident response firms, the brand damage that is associated with the attack, and then the cost of the actual payment itself if the ransom was paid. Uh, and lastly, IBM Security found that each data breach cost healthcare organizations an average of $10.93 million last year. Uh, and that cost has increased over 50% just over the past three years. Uh, next slide, please. So we included this quote from Josh Corman, who is the head of the COVID-19 Cybersecurity Task Force for CISA, because uh, it highlights what we're seeing. It is an understatement to say hospitals and clinics were under tremendous pressure during the pandemic. Cyber criminals knew this. They also knew that the health sector in the past typically lacked modernized environments and lacked mature cybersecurity controls, making it an easy, easier target compared to other industries. Uh, we included a screenshots of a few uh, recent devastating ransomware attacks carried out against the U.S. health sector. And unfortunately, cyber attacks targeting the health sector are here to stay. It is big business for cyber criminals. And as noted in the FBI Internet Crime Report here, attacks targeting the health sector continue to increase due to factors such as cyber criminals are, are becoming even more aggressive, uh, the emergence of ransomware as a service, which lowers the difficulty uh, for launching a successful attack. Uh, and these attacks are usually carried out by individuals that are outside of the US and outside of our jurisdiction. So they are able to operate with a lack of risks or repercussions. Next slide, please. 
So while malware variants and the groups launching these attacks, they're, they're constantly changing and evolving. The attack vectors that they use to infiltrate environments and steal data, they continue to be consistent. Uh, phishing is the most prevalent way that cyber attacks are able to succeed. The human element continues to be the most difficult to defend against. According to this year's Verizon data breach report, 74% of breaches involve the human element. All it takes is one user to fall victim and the threat actor has initial access to the environment. Uh, next is unpatched systems and systems that are uh, that surpassed end of life, which means they are no longer supported by the vendor. Simply put, if there is an, a vulnerability with an available exploit, attackers are likely going to use it. Uh, for abusing remote connections, the remote desktop protocol or RDP is, is one of the most popular communication protocols to connect one computer over one computer to another over a network. It is native within the, every Windows operating system. It has a very easy to use GUI, uh, and it is the default method to manage Azure virtual machines. All of that means is it's likely enabled. So all attackers need are valid credentials and for RDP to be enabled, and they're able to jump from computer to computer using native protocols, no need for installing fancy toolkits or writing any code. Uh, a common theme here is bad guys are very good at making their activity look like normal traffic. Um, for third parties and MSPs, we're seeing threat actors target third parties that have valid access to victim environments. So rather than attack each organization individually, threat actors are finding it's much more efficient to target a managed service provider that has legitimate access to IT assets for many different clients. And lastly, for weak external authentication, Attackers are looking for management consoles that are, are not behind a firewall and are visible from the internet. So some of the most high profile recent cyber attacks started because of a legacy VPN product that was still connected to the network and did not have multi-factor authentication enabled. Next slide, please. So we talked through attack vectors. Uh, at a high level, I also wanted to cover uh, what it, the anatomy of a ransomware attack looks like. So it starts with initial access. Threat actors use phishing, or they exploit a missing patch on an internet-facing server, or they use compromised valid credentials. The first step is establishing legitimate access. Uh, depending on the compromised account's privileges, they will move into reconnaissance and lateral movement. They will use RDP to connect to different computers on the network. They will disable antivirus and endpoint security software. They might go to GitHub and install toolkits like Mimikatz, which scrapes clear text passwords and password hashes from memory. Um, they will try to find backups and delete those. And they will use this access to con continue connecting to other systems, extract data, install ransomware executable files. And, and this phase could take hours or it could take weeks, depending on how the network is set up. Um, then comes deployment and extortion. Data is exfiltrated, ransomware files are executed, and systems and files are encrypted. Uh, the ransom demand is shown, noting the demand, demand amount, timelines and the Bitcoin wallet for paying the demand. And then a victim organization has to decide whether to pay the ransom or deal with the loss and rebuild from scratch. Next slide, please. We also wanted to talk about the ransomware group Black Hat, also known as Alfie or Noboris. Uh, they have been attributed to over a thousand attacks over the past few years. And they recently claimed responsibility behind recent devastating attacks on the health sector. They are a prolific and advanced ransomware as a service group, which uh, means it's a business model where other affiliates can use their ransomware variant and keep a percentage of the profits. In the past, Black Cat let affiliates keep 80 to 90% of the profits. Uh, it's larger compared to their competitors, uh, the other ransomware groups, uh, which are the profits usually 67%. So while other groups in the past have said hospitals are off limits, after the FBI seized Black Cat's infrastructure in December of 2023, their administrator posted a message to their affiliates and directly named hospitals and nuclear power plants as targets. And, and since they launched in November 2021, we have seen their attacks follow a similar playbook in, in Tradecraft. Uh, once they gain access to victim environments using compromised credentials, uh, these guys predominantly use IT tools to do their work. They install IT administration software like Screen Connect or Aterra, often in free trial. They use their access to change registry keys so that these tools don't show up and add or remove programs. Um, for lateral movement, these guys love to use native tools like PSExec, RDP, PowerShell. All of this means no malware, EDR solutions are not picking up on the activity, and their traffic just looks like normal administration, IT administration. 
Um, something that's very interesting and unique to these guys compared to other ransomware groups, uh, ransomware actors typically want to get in, spread as fast as they can, install ransomware executables, steal data, and get out and do so quickly so they don't get caught and get kicked out. Um, Black Hat and their affiliates, they like to enumerate the core routing and switching infrastructure. Um, it can tell you a lot about an environment and where you want to go next. Um, this is something that we typically see only advanced nation states do. It is a very advanced tactic and it is very, very effective in ensuring that the attack has maximum impact. Um, and lastly, their ransomware payload is written in a, a, a language called Rust. It is a very fast programming language. It is made for efficiency and it's made for high performance. It means they can deploy this variant so fast and it can infect both Windows and Linux systems, making them both highly advanced and hard to stop. And we wanted to talk through their tradecraft so that we can all keep in mind their tactics uh, when we're considering security measures. Uh, later on in today's presentation, we'll cover specific measures to consider to prevent becoming the victim of a cyber, cyber security attack. Uh, next slide, please. Great, uh, thanks, Phil. Uh, so this is Brian Finch, uh, and I'll just be presenting a, a couple slides of talking about uh, what some of the obligations are once you've been hit by ransomware. And to follow up on uh, one point on what uh, was just being discussed, you can't emphasize enough that this is a business. We were in fact just discussing some uh, ransomware war stories. And one of my favorites is that uh, was mentioned that there's a ransomware as a service where you can go out and purchase ransomware or uh, pay a group to conduct a ransomware attack. And there's a story we heard from law enforcement where the ransomware that was purchased uh, didn't work very well. Uh, and the entity that tried to purchase it complained to the ransomware um, as a service group's help desk. So they have a help desk. And within 30 minutes, they got a new piece of ransomware for free, an apology from senior management and a discount code for a future piece of ransomware. So if that doesn't illustrate you know, how, how crafty uh, as well as customer oriented these groups are, um, that should tell you everything you need to know. And boy, you know, there are a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, customer service experiences that uh, I wish they were that good uh, in the legitimate world. I'd certainly be leaving them a good Yelp review or what, whatever the case may be. Uh, but one of the things that I, I just wanted to chat briefly about is a newer issue. We're all aware of data breach disclosure requirements, et cetera. Um, but uh, groups, particularly in the healthcare arena, are now coming to grips with the Securities and Exchange Commission uh, and their new cyber disclosure rule. We, I didn't put the background on here, but the background is that as of September of 23 and December of 23, it was a two-phase implementation, entities are now required to disclose in their public filings what cybersecurity measures are in place, what management looks like, et cetera. And most importantly, as of December, within four business days, after determining a cyber event has occurred uh, and it's material, they have to publicly disclose via a filing with the Securities and Exchange Commission, an AK filing, uh, that you've suffered a material event. Uh, obviously, for entities like healthcare entities where operations are shut down, you have to you have to redirect patients, you have to cancel surgeries, et cetera. That's going to be immediately known. But even if that impact isn't immediately obvious to patients uh, and employees if it is material and could be material from a financial, from an operational or even a reputational perspective, that has to be disclosed within four business days. And under the cyber disclosure rule, there is a requirement that you make the uh, disclosure, make a determination of materiality, excuse me, in a reasonably timely fashion, meaning you gotta do it quickly. And failing to do it quickly can lead you to trouble with the SEC. And if there's an agency that you don't want to get into a tussle with, it's the SEC. It's great for us lawyers and consultants because they're, those investigations are lengthy, protracted, and exceptionally expensive. But we don't want our clients to go through it uh, because it's no good for anybody at the end of the day. Even if you win, you end up spending a lot of money on that. So you want to do it right. And one of the questions that constantly comes up is, well, what well, can we delay the notification, this four business day notification? There is an exception in the cyber disclosure rule that allows for a couple 30 day delays and then possibly uh, an indefinite delay when it comes to making the disclosure. And, that, uh, and people look at that and say, okay, well, we can put things off because we do know uh, if there's an active law enforcement investigation under a number of uh, data breach notification laws, you can withhold notification of the victims as well as public notice to attorney general, consumer, 
uh, uh, protection agencies within states, et cetera. If we go to the next slide, that is not the case really here when it comes to the SEC exception. If you're if you are under the jurisdiction of the SEC, you're an SEC registrant in the healthcare industry, you should expect that you will have 96 business hours, four days to four business days to make this disclosure. The Justice Department, in coordination with the Securities and Exchange Commission, issued guidance on this. And they clearly and repeatedly said that exceptions are rarely going to be granted, meaning that they're rarely, if ever, going to hand out these 30-day delays. Uh, and what they, where they said it might happen is that if it's a situation where disclosing the attack would undermine remediation for critical infrastructure, the attack method used, uh, um, used was a tactic or a technique that hasn't been seen before and there's no widely available risk uh, fix, excuse me, or there's sensitive government uh, information that is at risk for um, disclosure and could lead to wider national security harm. When they talk about critical infrastructure, of course, there are 16 different critical infrastructure sectors, but we're really talking about, at the end of the day, energy utilities, water, et cetera. Healthcare might fit in there, but if you read between the lines and you have discussions with DOJ and the SEC, that's not necessarily where they're looking at the end of the day. And on top of that, when you dig through the, the guidance from the uh, Justice Department, they say that one of their preferences is for disclosure and in that in that regard they will look to work with the victim who is making the disclosure to see if they can publish a narrowly tailored discla uh, disclosure under public filings meaning that they will want you to get some information out and notify investors investors being the key here that's the audience for the sec disclosure regime they want you to make some sort of notification to them to say boy this might not be a good investment what is the 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 net net of this is that if you're a healthcare organization that falls under uh, the SEC's jurisdiction uh, and you're worried about a ransomware event and you know that this could potentially happen to you at any given moment, be prepared once you've made a determination materiality to have four days to go make that filing uh, with the Securities and Exchange Commission. We've seen it happen. It's already happened in some cases post uh, December of 23 when the uh, the the rule went into place. And if we go to the next slide, uh, what we're seeing is already, we've seen uh, some of these filings being done since September of 23, and they've been talking about uh, management, uh, the management roles, board oversight. There have been discussions about newer threats like AI powered attacks. Uh, there have been references to specific best practices, both mandatory as well as uh, something like the NIST framework, which is general guidance for all entities. If we go to the 8K, uh, if we go to the next slide, we can see a specific 8K, or excuse me, go, go ahead, one further slide. Uh, if we go, uh, a sample 8K filing here um, is from uh, someone outside of the healthcare world, VF Corporation that makes sweatshirts and, and other clo uh, clothing items. And they talk about, in this particular case, how operations were disrupted, orders couldn't be filled, et cetera. So this is a, a good example here of what could be considered uh, uh, material in the case of, of any registrant with the SEC, including with healthcare. So if there is going to be a disruption to operations, if you believe that there's concern that patients may go to another healthcare network, may use a different system, different set of doctors, et cetera, move some of their appointments, that, that type of reputational harm is something that you'd want to disclose as well. And you want to be very careful about it because the failure to disclose and the failure to uh, make the proper disclosures, again, can lead to fines in the tens and tens of millions of dollars. One other point I would add here that I didn't write down is that uh, this also applies to third party entities, meaning that if you're a sweatshirt company and a software company that you rely upon or a managed service provider that you rely upon uh, suffers a cyber attack and that materially impacts you, that is going to require a disclosure as well. So it's not just your systems that you own and operate that you have to be concerned about. It's really part of your cyber, cyber ecosphere. Anything within that is going to fall under this category of what requires uh, a mandatory disclosure. The one other risk, uh, that if we go to the next slide, that I want to point out is that as an obvious one and, and an even more painful one, this is the you know government investigations. If you have a ransomware incident, if you have any other type of serious cyber attack on your system, 
you're guaranteed to be the subject, whether at the state or the federal level, to be the subject of congressional hearings, of administrative investigations. It could be from HHS. It could be from the Defense Department if you're doing uh, business with DOD. It could be from uh, Department of Homeland Security uh, looking at the FDA on medical device issues. You need to be prepared for that as well. And it goes to part of the overall picture that we're talking about, which is be prepared for these events. Assume they're going to occur. Let people know that you assume they're going to occur and be prepared to respond, not just from a technology perspective, but also from a public relations and an investigation perspective. This is going to happen and you don't want to assume, well, if we do everything right, we don't have to worry about it. Even if you do everything right, odds are 99.999% that you are going to be the victim of a cyber attack at some point. And you want to be able to explain why in, in painful detail, you did everything you could, but you still got attacked and it was a lot better than it could have been if you hadn't been prepared because you will be sitting there as a witness at some point. You will be answering letters that'll require tens of th thousands or tens of thousands of pages of documents in response uh, to the investigating entities. So this is something that uh, you really wanna be prepared for. And so that that that's my piece. And uh, if we go to the next slide, we can move on to um, the next part of the presentation from my great partner, Mark. Great. Thanks. Thanks very much, Brian. And uh, we wanted to focus in this next section on what happens during an investigation after you learn that you've been attacked. What are some of the legal issues that arise and some of the litigation as well? Now, here's a, a overview of matters that we've assisted other hospitals and other healthcare organizations dealing with HIPAA compliance as well as complying with other uh, personally identifiable information obligations as well. Um, so the first step is that there's a threat actor in your environment. Now, it can uh, the threat actor can gain access in a variety of ways, including phishing or ransomware, as we've been talking about, uh, as well as business email compromise and other means. Um, now, the surprising fact is that it can be many months before you learn that the threat actor has been in your environment for several months. And so the first um, step is once there is a detection, you want to implement your incident response plan. Uh, an initial question often concerns, what is the cyber insurance coverage? And we have um, attorneys who often help in those types of issues because even if you think you have coverage for one event, uh, such as ransomware, uh, you may or may not have coverage for business email compromise. So that's often an early question. One thing that we try to emphasize at the front end is implementing the attorney-client privilege so that you can get legal guidance concerning this incident and so that the communications about the incident will not be subject to uh, subpoenas uh, later on, um, either by regulators or in litigation, but so that you can um, meaningfully get the guidance that you need to, to manage uh, the incident. Um, after the detection and after those initial steps, the focus then turns to what is the scope of the incident? How did it happen? Uh, how long uh, were they in there? What um, records are available? What data was impacted? Now, we've already heard about legacy data. We've seen in a lot of these healthcare um, company uh, data breaches where there has been legacy data, 10, 15, 20 years old, that just was on the network. It had either protected health information or personally identifiable information that was available to the uh, threat actor. Um, often these um, incidents require a forensic analysis and it's important to consider bringing the attorney-client privilege to that forensic analysis. So for example, the ransomware that we've been talking about often includes um, malware. Um, th there's issues about the, how the malware operated whether there's decryption keys or other ways to deal with that and remediation steps. And that often requires external guidance uh, forensically to address those issues. Obviously, security uh, and remediation uh, are early uh, um, items that are uh, companies going to be dealing with. Uh, some companies or um, customers that you deal with may uh, become aware that there's been an incident. So you'll have to manage those inquiries and provide updates as well. On the next slide, you can see some of the other steps that occur as well. Now, in some instances, law enforcement can be useful and have intelligence uh, with respect to the incident, either to disrupt the threat actor or in providing a decryption tool. 
Um, after the uh, assessment of all the data, then there's going to be um, legal guidance with respect to what notifications are required. Uh, we had a matter that had 1.3 million patients that were impacted in um, a cyber incident that uh, required uh, remediation. Um, and if you cannot identify the individuals, then the HIPAA um, statute allows for substitute notice or media notice in appropriate circumstances. And then we get to the uh, regulatory in inquiries that often will follow. If it is patient data, then um, the Office for Civil Rights at Health and Human Services will initiate an inquiry. They um, often will do that after the notification is uh, posted on their uh, given to them, and then uh, it's often posted on their website. Uh, there may be concurrent regulators um, for public companies and SEC registrants, as Brian has um, outlined um, in a very uh, measured way. Um, th that may require notifications as well as with state attorney generals. So now you can see just there, uh, Brian was talking about um, four business days upon a materiality determination to notify the SEC whereas the Office for Civil Rights has a 60-day notification period. And so you're gonna be managing those various incidents. Uh, what do you know uh, at the time of notification? That can become very uh, challenging. And then um, often there are uh, class actions or other litigation that will follow. As you can see on the next couple slides, um, law enforcement often does have information. So uh, we've been talking about the black cat ransomware as one recent um, form of ransomware that has been very active the last several years. Uh, here's an example from April 2022, in which the FBI provided indicators of compromise, um, technical information that companies can use to help protect themselves from that type of information. On the next slide, you can see where Health and Human Services uh, provided uh, advisories with respect to the same ransomware group, um, noting that they have been targeting uh, public health companies and um, also uh, ho hospitals and, and those in the healthcare industry, and that they have been known to be in operation since November 2021. Now, this is something we often see in these types of incidents where there's threat intelligence that's gathered either by government agencies or in the private um, sector, and, and that information can be shared and can be useful for companies to help defend against the attack or to uh, learn how to uh, manage the attack if uh, extortionate demands or other um, steps are required. On the next slide, you can see that with respect to the same group, um, in December, just a few months ago, um, the FBI offered a decryption tool to um, more than 500 victims around the world with respect to uh, activity was, that was going on. And then in the next slide, you can see that the State Department has offered a 10, up to $10 million reward for the same group um, for information that can be useful to identify and uh, prosecute them. Uh, on the next slide, we see um, a summary of the HIPAA uh, breach notification rule. And so if there is an incident, there's gonna need to be a very careful assessment of what records were impacted um, and whether they contain protected health information. And that can be a very extensive review of the data, depending on the volume and the type of data that was involved. And often we'll work under attorney-client privilege with uh, data reviewers in assisting you know, with that uh, assessment as to what um, information might have been impacted. And it may be beyond uh, protected health information. It can be personally identifiable information or other sensitive information. You know, that may be required as well. Um, once there is notification, the regulators then will often initiate an inquiry, which can lead to a more formal investigation. We see on the next slide, uh, just a, a recent example where the Office for Civil Rights um, was able to uh, negotiate a settlement um, with the uh, company that um, had a uh, cyber incident. And we have assisted um, companies in work coordinating, working with the Office for civil rights as well. And then on the next slide, you can see that often there's a parallel investigation by the state attorney generals. In fact, the High Tech Act um, allows state attorney generals to bring civil uh, actions for HIPAA violations. And there are 54 different 
um, data breach notification requirements, including all 50 states in Puerto Rico, Guam, uh, the Virgin Islands, and the District of Columbia. And we've had um, incidents where we've had all 54 U.S. jurisdictions which have required notifications, and we've had others, you know, with less than that. But it does require some level of management. And um, we, when we have dealt with HIPAA-related matters, we, we have worked with state attorney generals and coordinating also with the at the federal level for, with the Office for Civil Rights with respect to investigations that uh, they may bring. Now, how does this um, off the notification process work? Well, many of these um, enforcers have an online form and you can see on the next slide, just an example from the California Attorney General Office. And once that is um, submitted to them uh, online and some, some will take a letter notification which allows you a little more leeway to explain the circumstances of what happened. Um, but once the form is submitted, um, each um, jurisdiction has a different policies as to whether they'll post the information. So the Office for Civil Rights will post um, the notifications that they receive. They're publicly uh, available. Um, and on the next slide, you can see the state of Maine does as well. And they're actually one of the first to post. And that's where uh, once the, these are posted, then the class actions often will file, uh, follow within days. And so um, we'll turn next to uh, class action litigation issues that often arise. And as you can see on the next slide, there's a many steps to the litigation process. Um, in cases that we've handled, again, within days of the posting, either with the Office for Civil Rights or uh, one of the state attorney generals, um, a, a number of uh, class action complaints will be filed. And then there is uh, a jockeying that goes on with the litigants as to who's going to be the lead uh, plaintiff or lead counsel. Uh, once that's determined, the court will order a consolidated complaint um, to deal with. Uh, there may be motions to dismiss for failure to state a claim, uh, as well as uh, discovery and other matters that go on. Um, in the uh, litigation process. This can take two to three years just to get through this process, depending on uh, the jurisdiction. Um, on the next slide, we wanted to highlight what are some issues that arise in the, the uh, class action litigation involving a data breach. Uh, one is just jurisdiction. And so what often will apply to these types of cases is the Class Action Fairness Act and that requires that the amount of controversy exceed $5 million and that there be some diversity between the parties. And that's often alleged um, in these uh, class actions. Now, there's often very little public information about the incident until one of those attorney general notifications is posted. And even in those letters that are uh, provided have very little information. And so these allegations will be made um, and sometimes are on information and belief, meaning that they um, are stating that they have a, a good faith basis to make the allegation, but they don't yet know. And But that that is what they're trying to find out is, you know, in the course of the litigation, what more information is known. But often they work with very limited information. Now, there are exceptions that apply and, and sometimes it gets fairly complex with respect to the Class Action Fairness Act, whether jurisdiction can be met. And we have had success in working with these exceptions in um, uh, noting that a jurisdiction is not appropriate um, in federal court. Uh, on the next slide, we see some other issues that can arise. Now, when there is a data breach, if there's a federal case under the Constitution, under Article Three, it requires what they call standing. And that requires that um, a discrete injury be identified. And uh, there are many cases that cannot meet that threshold. Just because there's been an attack, does that mean that the data that was um, exfiltrated resulted in an injury that can be identified? Um, separate from that, many of these class actions allege a negligence claim, um, which requires proximate cause, which is a difference um, uh, level of proof that's required to show that there is uh, causation or a nexus with the incident and the alleged in, uh, injury. Um, now, surprisingly, many of these class actions contain allegations on how the healthcare company failed to comply with HIPAA standards. And we've been successful in striking those because 
HIPAA creates an enforcement action with the um, Health and Human Services, but it does not create a private right of action. But um, we see uh, many of these uh, class actions will refer to um, a violation of HIPAA and that, you know, some remedy, you know, may be uh, necessary as a part, as a result of the uh, class action. Um, and then on the next slide, we can see that um, um, if jurisdiction and those other issues can be resolved, the court will ultimately need to consider whether the class can be certified. And that does not always happen. For example, you can see the requirements that apply. Um, you know, are there, uh, common, are there common questions of law and fact, which requires that the class members suffered the same injury? And so the facts can vary in, on whether or not class certification can be met. Um, this is just an overview that we wanted to share with you. And we do recommend for companies that are dealing with an incident at the front end to think of these regulatory issues. Think of the um, uh, matters that Brian raised about the materiality um, requirement if you uh, have to comply with that at the very front end, uh, as well as other notification and potential litigation. We found that managing the incident on those issues at the front end will help as you move through the um, timeline of the uh, incidents. And with that, we'd like to turn to our uh, next segment. Thank you all. On, as I mentioned uh, previously, on the heels of cybersecurity incidents, um, there are a variety of implications um, and entities have to address and think about not just recovering immediately from the attack, but also um, the ongoing implications. One thing that is not necessarily thought about, but is particularly important for to you know to keep top of mind, is that there are fraud implications that happen um, once the data uh, is out in the public um, beyond just the simple extortion that is that is. Uh, associated with the cyber attack itself, uh, meaning you know, the, the, the bad actors uh, requesting extorting uh, money from, from the entity, there are also uh, implications and uh, fraud schemes that can arise from bad actors. So just a, just a couple of examples. Uh, bank account theft. Because there's data out there and available, uh, depending on the scope of the data, those bad actors, fraudsters, could gain access to banking and financial information that is stored somewhere within the healthcare system. Um, this can be revenue cycle data related to the patients. This can be bank account payment AR information uh, for the providers uh, that that uh, you know submit and receive claims. So there are a number of different places where bank account theft and and rerouting of funds uh, you know can can occur. Same thing for the patients. Uh, another area to be aware of is, is false claims. Suddenly, uh, with, with a data breach, you've got patient information available. You've got uh, provider information available, perhaps the NPIs. Uh, you've got bank account and other identifying information available. And what we see typically on the back of a cyber attack is an increase in false claims being submitted. In other words, um, you know, and, and, and that may be uh, fictitious claims, quite frankly, uh, being submitted to um, submitted to payers for for reimbursement, uh, utilizing the data that's been uh, uh, leaked. Identity theft, likewise, personal information that's obtained during the the breach could be used uh, for for identity theft, applying for credit, uh, obtaining medical services uh, under another person's name. Uh, the variety of, of identity theft related frauds that uh, can occur, uh, prescription and equipment and the supply uh, fraud, the, the stolen patient data uh, could, for example, be used to forge prescriptions um, from the providers uh, for controlled, controlled substances um, and uh, that, 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 that uh, you know, bad actors, patients get access to. Um, or similarly, fraudulent orders for medical equipment, medical supplies that are used, um, again, using that same information. So some ongoing implications that happen on the, on the back end uh, related to fraud. Next slide, please. 
the other thing that you'll see is, um, and, we, and we've seen this of late, is major uh, warnings and precautionary uh, messaging that comes out from uh, industry groups like uh, the uh, American Hospital Association, American Medical Association. Uh, Mark and Brian talked about state attorneys general uh, and other branches of the government. Sometimes you see, uh, for example, warnings that will come out from the FTC um, or from the White House or from, uh, from, from other entities warning folks about uh, the increased risk of financial fraud following those, those data breaches. The next slide, please. Uh, recent example uh, for just we see this happening uh, real time. Uh, the Minnesota Attorney General has uh, recently um, received some reports uh, that uh, state attorney, the state hospital associations are getting uh, notif notifications from patients that have been targeted by scammers that are seeking to steal their credit card information, um, and uh, and um, and they are posing in many cases as. As, as healthcare providers offering uh, uh, refunds or um, you know other other uh, you know other mechanisms to obtain uh, the credit card number and patients are are giving those over. Uh, next slide, please. A couple of other examples of um, organizations and authorities um, issuing fraud warnings. Just just um, AHA. As I mentioned, uh, and uh, the Cybersecurity Advisory at AHA uh, offering some recommendations for healthcare organizations that are affected. Uh, just some uh, some some examples of things that uh, that uh, they should be doing, and, and folks in the industry need to be doing um, to to recover and um, and and address and address those those issues. Um, the Vermont. Uh, Department of Financial Regulation, for example, issuing similar warnings as uh, what we touched on in, in Minnesota. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Eric Bupo to talk about what you all can do to <clears throat> protect yourself. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, if you could uh, proceed to the first slide. There, there are some key things that we see at GuideHouse uh, as part of cyber security posture overall, uh, considered best practices. Uh, and just drawing from past experience uh, as a CIO and then certainly working with a lot of hospitals and health systems, pretty standard stuff that you would see uh, quite a bit. Um, it's when it's not implemented either in concert or when you, you just have one of these pillars not being in place where what we have certainly tended to see with preventative measures and cybersecurity uh, issues arise, like we've talked about rents work. So on the next slide, I mean, first main thing, um, always want to have uh, some level of backups, uh, and both backups in the sense of uh, what is your actual backups to, uh, and in terms of solutions and systems, knowing what those are, but more importantly, a broader strategy. So it's got to be periodic. You got to test it. You got to make sure you run lo some level of encryption on it, but also that it's aligned to uh, at, certainly at a hospital level with service lines. You're making sure your backup strategy is aligned across all of your operational uh, components. So you know what applications are out there, what data is out there that needs to be backed up. You don't want to miss anything uh, in terms of that backup approach overall. Um, on the next slide, what we also look at is vulnerability scanning and patching. Just a common thing that comes up uh, with ransomware. Uh, open uh, ports, very common. Um, looking at uh, with security features and making sure that everything is turned on uh, and enabled. Uh, that's another common one. Uh, even things as simple as uh, making sure you automatically update for antivirus. Certainly something I've seen uh, at a CIO level, people will turn that off, don't like it, um, don't like anti malware messaging uh, that pops up on their screen. And then the same thing with patches. You have users that might say, hey, I don't wanna wait for my machine to update overnight. Um, not something I, I, I like. Uh, something might break. Uh, it, all of those things uh, cumulatively, if we're if you are not maintaining a certain level in terms of vulnerability scans uh, and configuration management overall, it opens up particular areas of attack. Uh, next slide. Uh, you, you also look at with, with phishing and incident response. 
Um, fishing, um, I, I'll highlight what we call social engineering also, but just the, the common thing of malicious emails. Take a look at what the email address actually is. Uh, just a simple thing I used to remind people of. Make sure you're looking in terms of your applications uh, that you're implementing certain things, um, uh, whether it's macros for Microsoft Office uh, or with uh, domain-based message authentication, just understanding where things are coming from. Macros was common because people always want to turn them on. Um, and sometimes you have to say no. Uh, com common whether it's CIO, CISO, et cetera. Uh, so these are the types of things with phishing attacks that attackers are going to exploit. And then the same thing with a really solid IR plan. If you don't have that, uh, and phishing is a great example to tie to this because uh, that's where you're going to have IR be tested quite a bit. And we would use phishing attack uh, simulations uh, as an example of testing our incident response. How quickly can we go through our contact trees? How quickly can we document um, what we need to know uh, about a phishing incident, about other types of incidents, and then making sure we have preservation strategy in place. We want to be testing these, not just a piece of paper where it's a plan, but let's test this and make sure it works. I want to highlight social engineering on the next slide because there's been recent um, areas um, with ransomware. Uh, apologies, uh, one more slide ahead, but I'll, I'll stay on this one because uh, it comes up quite a bit uh, with, with ransomware uh, events uh, of with IR testing and making sure that you're implementing those disaster recovery backup business continuity plans, IR plans. Th there's common approaches to this and why we mentioned this is uh, on the next slide with social engineering, uh, it's, it's a perfect use case example we're seeing now post uh, cyber attacks that have occurred across different organizations where we're seeing, hey, you know, I did this to one organization, let me try some different approaches. So social engineering attacks is, let me pretend I'm somebody else, use a stolen identity, uh, and in this case, I'm going after RevCycle, I'm going into sensitive financial roles, where I'm a, a threat actor, I'm able to go in, use stolen PII data, like a name, social security number, and trick a IT help desk into doing a password reset. Once I do that, even if they have MFA, uh, which is multi-factor authentication, it's a layer that you're adding where you're you're making sure somebody is who they say they are, uh, attackers will trick it. And we're seeing this at hospitals uh, where they're going in and doing these types of uh, social engineering attacks. And the damage from it is more interesting because what you see in terms of IR response is you're dealing with somebody that's going in to change payment instructions to send a, not just data now, we're going into finances. So we're pushing payments out to fraudulent accounts or delivering malware onto the network and maybe doing that a little later. So always gotta be building things like this into your tabletops uh, for incident response where you're saying, okay, let's test out on a password reset. Are we checking, is a person there that actually exists? Do we have supervisory checks? Are we making sure that we match numbers uh, on MFA uh, for push notifications, that we're not just sending out pushes to any device uh, that's out there? So building that in, and then on the next slide, um, what we see a lot with uh, revenue cycle cyber tax as an example with healthcare organizations is it impacts everything. Claims, remittance, you go into pharmacy, you, you're, you're hitting all through front to back end and you don't always know what the impacts might be. So with a tabletop uh, exercise, testing your IR plans, testing your DR plans, you're looking to see, do I have secondary tertiary products that I'm using that might impact my patient eligibility uh, because it might run off a clearinghouse network? Um, do I have a situation where I have a plan, not just let's talk about cybersecurity, but do I, as part of my incident response, can I pivot to a new clearinghouse to send claims? Can I work through manual abstraction and going to paper posting? So you don't wanna just concentrate in IR uh, and DR on how do I just focus on the cybersecurity aspect, but the business aspect as well. And then what we also see is um, th those issues of just being able to shift in terms of resources. So making sure you're testing with plans on cash flow issues, on manual labor shifts that are needed. You've tested these out as well uh, as part of an overall incident response. And then on this last piece with, um, next slide, uh, just looking at cybersecurity hygiene, 
a lot of what our customers are asking us right now about cybersecurity programs and business continuity and are common topics. We don't just talk about the plan itself, but making sure you've got uh, some of your specific financial aspects built in. So you're looking closely at patient intake management. What's going to be the impact if I have a cyber incident? What that clearinghouse risk might be. So going down to the level of uh, just in terms of being able to do payment posting and reconciliation strategies. What would that look like if that broke down uh, in terms of business continuity? So we plan for that. Uh, looking at payment and loan options. So we plan for that. Looking at anything related to our payer risk exposure, if it's working across different clearinghouse networks. Uh, just as an example that can happen in any cyber attack, you got to make sure that payers will be able and willing to work across different networks and um, able to do that. And then lastly, with all your cyber factors, that it's integrated. So you have a, a identity and access management posture you've built, make sure it's integrated into your revenue cycle management. So you know what role specifically might be at risk in the social engineering attack, where would I be in terms of being able to quickly recover my security operations overall, uh, so I'd be able to monitor, uh, be able to look at threat intelligence, vulnerability management, that those types of things aren't knocked out uh, as part of uh, any type of ransomware or cybersecurity incident. So I'll pass that on uh, now next slide. Um, I think we're at the concluding remarks and closing questions. That's right. Well, listen, we are uh, about two minutes past, um, you know, we have about two minutes left in the in the session. We want to certainly appreciate um, and, and thank everyone that's uh, joined us today. Um, again, we will be looking to do um, some some add on series in the, in the future coming off of this, but, um, you know, really, really important topic. And uh, we just want to say thank you. If, if you have questions, um, there is a question feature, a Q and A feature that you can type in. I'm not seeing any right now. Um, and then, and then, you know, if, 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 um, if you'd like to follow up with us, we also have uh, listed here, our contact information, you know, we're, we're available anytime to, uh, answer your questions. But again, just wanted to thank everybody and appreciate uh, appreciate your time. And I think uh, I think with that, that'll conclude our presentation today.